my brothers, good evening uh, to you and uh, to any of our, our guests who may be watching, or should I say good morning or good afternoon, and uh, some I could be saying good night to, uh, but welcome to uh, Let's Talk About God, where we are still on the topic of difficult Bible verses, and um, this week we have Hyper. Harper will be sharing with us about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Amen. And that is that is a very um, interesting, but also very important topic. So we will be paying uh, uh, specific attention or, or close attention to Hyper and what he has to say to us on this, this topic of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And... Um, I just want to say in our normal tradition, um, you know, after Hyper finished giving his uh, discussion on the difficult verse or verses, then we will open up the, the panel uh, for question and answers. And um, look, the question and answers are directed towards the panel, uh, not towards our specific speaker for the evening. And anyone from the panel can answer or comment on um, the difficult verses or any questions that may arise. Um, we do ask that you keep all uh, questions relevant to the discussion topics and verses. Um, but if you do uh, have a question co contrary to tonight's discussion, feel free to email us at letstalkaboutgod3 at gmail.com or you can hit us on Facebook Messenger at uh, Let's Talk About God. Um, also, I just want to say, by accepting this invitation, you give us permission to have these uh, Zoom sessions recorded and posted on our social media platforms, YouTube and Facebook group. Um, also, I think it's important that we, we highlight uh, this particular note that I'm about to share, which is that we would like to make it clear that we accept all walks of life and do not discriminate no matter your race, gender, or your denominational background. We are just sharing what we have discovered individually by studying God's word uh, during the past week. We espouse the view, we hold strong to the view of the great apostle Paul, where he says, let everyone be convinced in their own mind according to their own convictions and their own conscience. And you can read the entire verse in Romans chapter 14, verse five. Again, today's discussion is the cleansing of the sanctuary and we will have hyper leading us on these difficult verses. Um, that concludes my introduction and welcome to everyone. And now we'll pass it over to James for a opening prayer. Oh man, let's pray. Our loving Father, thank you so much, Lord, to give us this opportunity again to come to join each other <coughs> for this um, uh, talk about the difficult verse in the Bible. And today we have our brother, Ipa, who will take the, the talk. And I'm sure, Lord, you will baptize him and with your Holy Spirit, and he might find the word easy to share with us. And we might learn something we never know before as well and bless each one of us and thank you so much for your word and thank you so much also for the baptism of the Holy, Holy Spirit on each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we thank you thee. Amen. 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 Thanks for the introduction, Sean, and as well for the prayer and for the Holy Spirit to fall upon us and the people that's watching it too. Um, sometimes when we come onto this um, a platform, we share our ideas and sometimes we don't always share the verses. We don't always are clear enough. But we, we hope that people can go home and listen to it and, and study it for themselves. And even if they didn't understand some points, they can contact us like Sean has explained um, and, 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 and ask the questions because we like to explain things properly. But we have such a short time to do it. And tonight's topic is a huge topic. Um, I'm going to only discuss some parts of it. So it's not in the fullness, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, even when I look at the um, look at it and, and the dates that's been given, it's it's a it's it's you have to really sit quietly and study it. Um, um, 
um, Satan would like us to forget this important message of the cleansing of the century, especially in the last days. He wants us to push it aside or, or, or interpret it the wrong way and leave out the most important part of the cleansing of the century, which we believe is the center of our belief. Um, only the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, believes in the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I think there's something very, very, very important about this uh, topic. Satan would like us to focus on the work of, of Satan in the world, the work that he's doing in the world. You know, sometimes we have these prophecies and we watch what's happening around us. And we say, yes, the end is coming. Yes, the end is coming. But there's certain things that God has put in place, not Satan, God put in place. And this, um, this prophecy of the cleansing of the sanctuary, God put in place. He, he gave this prophecy to, to his people to know, to tell them there's something important going to happen um, when he spoke to Daniel. Something very important before he can come to the second coming. So we'll go into it a little bit more. And um, we're not going to speak this tonight. Um, um, we're not going to speak about, is it a place? Because there's so many places where it speaks that Jesus is the temple. We know there's, there's the heavenly temple where, where God resides in. And, and in the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, the, the place of God's presence. Um, we also um, um, know that, that God is not speaking about buildings here. Because there's a verse in the Bible that speaks, because here again, I would have liked to put that verse in where it speaks, um, this temple is not built with human hands. Um, so it's not the way we sometimes understand it as a building, but more so much as, as, as uh, the presence of God. Uh, and I'll explain to you a little bit more about that. Um, um, then even... Uh, when people misapply the materials, the brick, the mortar, um, these are all symbolic um, interpretations of the cleansing of the sanctuary. If, if I can give you an example of the outer court of the sanctuary, the outer court, we all know, was symbolic of the life and death of Jesus Christ. It's, it's not a building. It's not a, a fence that's in heaven around God. It was this earth and where Jesus died. The sacrifice was made on, on, on the altar. And that is the outer court. Here we can see, even with, with Bible study, we know that the outer court represented Jesus' life and his crucifixion. And, um, but there's something important that there was, because in the sanctuary is our salvation. David says it, in your sanctuary is our salvation plan. And I mentioned it in one of our talks that it's important that we understand the plan of salvation. And some people think the plan of salvation is over. Yes, Jesus did die. He gave us salvation. But the plan is not finished yet to, to win everybody so that sin will never enter this universe. Today, I would like to consider this, that the cleansing of the sanctuary in reality is the cleansing of our hearts and minds. And that is why it's important for us. It's not, it's, yes, there is things happening in heaven. But if we want to understand it, there are a lot of things that's not really explained or we can see what's happening in heaven. But the real cleansing of the sanctuary, and I'll show you this, it's the cleansing of our hearts and minds. And, and what happens in heaven normally happens on earth because it gets discussed. Let's look at hyper and let's save his life. But it's discussed in heaven and God actually comes down through his Holy Spirit and give us the remedy to be saved. And that is what the cleansing of the sanctuary means. And, and we'll see why a specific day. Because we know, we know in the entire time of the Bible that God always wanted to cleanse the heart and mind. And he's always been doing it. But why is there significance to 1844? And I'll share it with you. As we go through, we can also consider that uh, we must also now consider this message is just as important as any other truth for us today. 
like Sean has said, it's a very important truth. Today, I don't want to focus on the calculations of prophecy, but there will be a few calculations just to show us why we believe in this prophecy. I would like to focus on the cleansing of the heart and mind, like I said before, and what this means for us. And this is just as important as the second coming of God. Um, and this is where it starts, Daniel 8 verse 14. And it said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So what do I mean? What do I mean? I hope I can get this up. Let me just start with this. Um, now you can see my screen. Can you guys see my screen? No. Can you see it now? I'm sure you no. can. No. Okay. Um, give me one second. Let me just minimize that and then move that. Bigger, bigger. Can you see it now? Yes. So what, what the cleansing of the sanctuary was given it was given to Daniel, and you will find this in Daniel chapter 14, chapter 8, verse 14, which I've just read. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now there, if you look at this picture, just in closing, as uh, it's, and when you read around this verse, it, it speaks about when the temple will be rebuilt, at the time when the temple will be rebuilt. So when you cal calculate it, when Artaxerxes actually gave the charge to build, rebuild the temple after they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, the Israelites were to rebuild since their time and up to 1844, it calculates, or 1843, as some may say is the calculation of the sanctuary cleansing. Now, when God looked so far ahead in time, he was trying to say, I want to start something very important during that time. Many believe that it was actually the second coming, but it wasn't. It was something special God wants to share. And this is what I'm wanting to share too. And that is the, the um, 1844, which is how many years now? 160 years? No, 180 years from then, right? If you calculate it from now on, it's about 100, just more or less. I don't want to be the exact. So, so we've been um, living in this time where the sanctuary is being cleansed, right? Now, why did God come up or, or why did this day come up? Why do you think? Because we know that when Jesus came, he gave so much truth, so he revealed himself. And remember, we're speaking about our hearts and minds, and he changed so many people's lives by giving them the love he wants them to have. So he handed over all the blessings, all the righteousness of God, and it filled in so many people's lives. You look at the people uh, on the day of Pentecost that went out and told, and so many converts came into this truth. But something else happened after that. 500 and let me just come to this date. Um, let me switch off. Okay, let me still share, but I, I want to just read. Um, there's another prophecy that's, that's, that's written in, in Daniel as well. And this is the prophecy, Daniel 12, verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished, right, and the abomination that causes desolate is set up, there will be 1,290 1, days. So, so, the abolishment of the sacrifice was Jesus Christ, but then the abomination that causes desolation is set up. That was in 538 after Christ to the time 1798. So there was, there's a discrepancy between that time and in 1798, the, the papal Rome's power was taken away. 
it received the wound. And this is the verse in Daniel 7, verse 25, it speaks about this prophecy, in which the, the saints of the Most High shall be given into the hand until a time and times dividing of time. So it speaks here about the time that the saints, that the people of God was given over to this power. And this giving over of the power actually um, removes, um, not removes, but actually there was a lot of truth lost. So, so during five, say from there, if you look at my point, to say from there to just 17, um, what is it, 1798, just before there was a time that, that the saints were given over to this abomination. So there was a falling away and the Bible speaks about this. So I just want to cancel the, the diagram so that people can understand what I was trying to say. I'm just going to close this and then go into and stop sharing my screen. And then I can see everybody clearly. Yep. So, so, so there was a falling away. And this is what the Bible says. The Second Thessalonians 2 verse 1 to 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not after the coming. You know, Thessalonians was written. By the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his gathering together unto him, that he be not soon, soon shaken so in mind or in trouble, neither by the spirit nor by the word, nor by letter is from us. As that day of, of Christ is at hand. So he says it's at hand, it's coming. But let no man deceive you by any means, for that they shall not come, except there comes a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, so during all this prophecy, what actually happening, there was a falling away. Now we know what this falling away meant. And that is why we have Pentecost, uh, not Pentecostal, sorry, um, what they call it, the um, that went against the Catholic Church or the Papal Rome, um, uh, Protestants, right? Then we found the Protestants coming. So the Protestants started writing the Bible. L let me just say what this falling away meant, right? It what was taken from the gospel with this falling away. God's law was changed from design law to man's law. What do I mean with design law? You know, if you look at design law, we look at um, when God was a creator and we worship him as a creator, he, he created certain laws in nature. And when he said to Adam and Eve, you shall surely die if you eat of it fruit, he did not say you, I will kill you. But he says, this is how I've designed the world to be. Now man came into power, like we said, um, before, this falling away. And he changed God's law and he says God's law is arbitrary. God says this. God says, I need to punish you for sinning. And my punishment is death. And that death comes from God. That was the first thing. That's why we have the, 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 the Yal um, doctrine that keeps so many people away from God. That people will, will burn forever and ever that every sin will be burned out of you. We believe that happens, but we don't believe it comes from the hand of God and how many people perceive it to be. And um, I, I've put punishment of death comes from God, paying for our sins. You know, that's paganism. In the Old Testament, people used to pay with their children to satisfy their God. People used to, used to pay certain amounts, give something. Now you say to me, yeah, but there were sacrifices in the Bible. No, the sacrifice was only a symbol. The sacrifice never saved or, or, or that God can accept us. And that's all paganism. All this was brought in by this falling away. And, and today our minds are darkened by this falling away. The word of God, like I said, was kept away from me. Um, was kept away from me. And what happens when you don't have the word of God? What happens? You start to believe the people that's telling you what is the truth. You know? Okay. Now, all this happened. And we know the dark ages. What, what happened in the dark ages? They started burning the books. 
because they rejected this gospel. They rejected that they want to serve a God, that they that they punishes them if they don't listen, uh, uh, that, that that's going to destroy them and burn them forever. They rejected paying for their sins with their, with their money, with money to save their people. There were so many things that were given to people that was infected them in such a way that they could not see Christ. Now, we know what happened to Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve distrusted God in the Garden of Eden, what did they do? They hid from God. Sorry, Sean. You're... All right. They ran, they ran and hid. Yes, they ran and hid. And this is what happened. When people saw this character of God being portrayed by the, that time in the church of, of that, or not of that time, but the time that the falling away took place, people felt afraid of God. They felt they were afraid of, 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 of their sinful deeds. They were afraid of, of, of even asking God for forgiveness because they had to ask somebody else and give them money towards it. And all this fell away. And, and, and what happens when we have this sinful attitude not to trust God? What happens? Fear sets in, like I said, right? And then when fear sets in, what's the original thing? Selfishness. People become selfish because they are caring about themselves, survival of the fittest. And because you feel like survival of the fittest, then you have sinful acts. So it, everything rolls into this, right? So if you look at the, the, the true nature of what sin does to us, it changes our attitude firstly towards God. And then uh, that is sin itself, not to trust God then we become like a selfish nature and we have selfish acts. So to reverse this, we cannot start at the point of sinful acts, telling people, stop doing this, stop doing that, because they can't. That's the habit, that's the way of life. We know it's only Christ. Who makes us righteous? Christ Jesus. So we have to start at the first point. It's almost like when you open up a fossil of a tap, you know, the water runs over and it runs on the floor. You just keep on wiping, but you don't close the tap on top. So, so, so closing the tap is giving people that opportunity to trust God and, and giving the image of God to be trusted. And this is the vital point where I'm at. So all these things were removed from humanity and God wants to restore it in 1844. God wants to restore his image back into the hearts and minds of people. And the whole world is, 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 is under this darkness of not knowing who God is. And, and, and where does it start? Where do you think it starts? Where does this message of the century start? If we go to 1 Peter 4 verse 17, for the time is come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? You understand? So what Peter is speaking here about, that, that when, when we, we as the Levites is having this message of the truth of God's gospel, which is opposite to what I've read before, where we need to build trust in, where, where we need to build first trust in us that we can trust God and take this message of love to others, that's where it starts. God wants to first set up, but people are so confused. People from all sorts of, of, of religions. I'm not just talking about one religion here. I'm talking about the whole religion of this earth because we were put under a cloud of darkness about God's character and about his government, how he runs and how he does things. So, um, let me just quickly just go over my notes to where I am. Okay, yes. So if you look in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, I think many of us know this verse. It says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man be a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified that thy sayings and and might, mightiest overcome them, overcome when thou art judged. So what I'm going to read another um, 
uh, another uh, verse as well. So here it says that when we judge God, when we look at God's character, we may see that he is right, that he is not a liar. We need to come to that point because deep in our hearts, since the time of Adam and Eve, deep is settled the lie about God's character. And that is why we always talk about God to bring people back into a relationship with God so that God can heal them. Romans 3 verse 4, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Revelation 14 verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Many people say he judges people. God always judges, but he judges more like a doctor, diagnoses a situation and he gives him. But when you see this judgment, it speaks more clearly that the judgment, the hour of God's judgment has begun. So when you speak about the cleansing of the sanctuary, we tell people, now we're looking at God's character. We're trying to find out, is God really a person that we cannot trust? A person that we can have confidence? And we start looking, and this is what Revelation 14 verse 7 is saying. And they sing a song. This is uh, Revelation 15 verse 3. This is the song we will sing before we enter heaven, before Jesus could come. And they sing a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. What, what do people sing? Firstly, they say, marvelous are thy works. They gave him praise. They also say, he is the mighty Lord in God. He's almost giving them a, God authority over their lives and their hearts. But also, he's also saying, just and true and true are their ways. It means God is righteous. God is doing things right. He's not um, taking any. And that is the song we will sing. God cannot come if this world doesn't know that he is exactly like them. And if you look at um, that verse, verse 14 and 17, uh, sorry, uh, Revelation 14 to 17. It's saying, saying with a loud voice, fear God. Now, it's not a fear to be scared, but reverence. So, so, so I don't want to go into that because we've discussed it before. But I want to speak about the loudness of this voice. It won't just be us sitting on this platform that's speaking about God in this way. It will be a huge amount of people. A huge amount of people. Yeah. And the government won't be happy with it. But God has to first prepare us to be like that. Because we will fall over when the government persecution happens. We will fall over. So the preparation of God's people are so, 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 so important. That we can shout with a loud voice. We will stand against presidents, kings, against leaders of this world to share this gospel, to share this good news about God's character and his government. So we need to trust God and we need to, we need to trust him and love him. And when we trust God and have the confidence, we don't become selfish. We start loving others. We start caring. And when that happens in our hearts, God can then, because the whole world will see two pictures of God, the picture that Satan wants to show and the picture of God in his people. To understand that we need to, the thing we need to understand is the first infection and it is trusting God. We need to understand that the right attitude towards God can only happen with the correct understanding and appreciation of his character. However, their minds, this, this is 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14 to 16. And this is what I was speaking before. However, their minds became closed. In fact, to the days, to the day, the same veil is still, today he says, the same veil is still there when they read the Old Testament. So Paul is speaking to in 2 Corinthians to the Corinthians. He says that same veil is in front of them. Yet even today, when they read the books of Moses, a veil covers their minds. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. 
which means God wants us to come directly to him and speak to him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, sorry, Sean. I said amen. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19 to 22 says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of the death for us. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's people, let us go right into the presence of God with a true heart fully trusting in him for for our evil conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. There is the hearts that will receive Jesus. So this is the vital question. People are watching the devil. Yes, God gave us way much to see the end. But this is the important part. God says in Revelation 7 verse 3, the angel the angel said, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until, the mark, until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. So why didn't God come? God didn't come because we are not sealed yet. We are not sealed. And it needs to be a, a kingdom that God will set up. But this kingdom is not a kingdom of fighting to win this world. But it will be a kingdom like God spoke about Job when Satan started prowling the earth and coming up to heaven and saying, I own the world. Then God said to him, have you seen my friend Job? That is what he will say to us. Have you seen the people that has taken that world away from you? They don't believe what you are saying about me. They believe that they can trust and have confidence. And you know what? Satan, I can fully heal them if they trust me. I can fully heal them, completely heal them. And I do believe God wants us to know them. So why start in 1844? Let me just go over to what it is. It's just that something happened. There was a falling away. But before God could meet his bride, we need to be ready. We need to be dressed up beautiful. I remember looking at my wife when I waited in front of her. She just didn't wear any dress when she came to, to our wedding. She had a specific dress. It wasn't a blue or black or red. It was a white dress that represents purity, love, kindness, peace. That is what God is coming for. And I'm going to share this quickly. This is, this is the sanctuary, Malachi 3, verse 1 to 3. See, I will send my messenger. Remember, it always speaks about the Elijah message. Remember, there was John the Baptist. There will be a message at the end that the people of God will send to the world. But this will be a loud cry. And it says, I will send my messenger. This is in Malachi 3, verse 1 to 3. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. Come to our hearts. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure that day of his coming? Remember, it speaks about that. Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, a laundress soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites. Listen to that. First, and refine them gold and silver. It's important that God has a group of people that study the Bible that can take this message to the world. So that God can, can give every opportunity to make up people's minds so people can be sealed. Um, we know what the greatest test will be in the end. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart, this is what will happen. The heart is united with his heart. The will is merged with his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. 
we love his life. So, in the sanctuary, our sins aren't covered. No, we love the life of Christ. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of righteousness. This is what she says. The heart and mind is clear. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the thick leave garments, not the nakedness, deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which he gave to us, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. That is out of Christ Object Lessons, page 311, verse 4. And I, she lovely puts it together what we would look like. Come as living stones, it says, 1 Peter 2, verse 5 to 6. Here it speaks about the stones this, that, that, that makes up the building or the temple or the sanctuary. Come as living stones and let yourself be used in the building of, of a spiritual temple where you will serve as a holy priest to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. What is the spiritual acceptable sacrifices? It's our purity, our love for Christ, and what Christ has instilled for us. For the scripture I chose is valuable, sorry, uh, sorry, scripture, uh, uh, for the scripture says, I chose a valuable stone which I am placing as the cornerstone in Zion, and whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. So here we see the unfolding of God's life in us that we will share with others. And that's where I'm going to close. And I just wanted to share with my brothers this message God would like us not to speak about, that God wants to take a message to the world about his character. And it will be loud. It won't be just on a, on a platform like this. You mean Satan doesn't want us to take this message to God? I mean, to the world, not God. No, to, the, to his people first, to the Levites. Right. If we, if we don't speak about it, if we don't speak about it, we can't be understanding what is our role. No, what is our yeah, role. no, 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 no. I was only referencing that you started off by saying God doesn't want us to take this message to the world. And all I was saying oh, was sorry, yeah, you yeah, may say Satan. Satan, Satan, God yeah. wants us, God wants us right. to, to look at the cleansing of the sanctuary and see the importance of it so that we can actually uh, uh, prepare, not we, we, God working in us, uh, uh, give a message to the world that, that the world feels so overwhelmed with. And, and, and there's a lot of different stories and, and importance on other things rather than this. Because like we say, God cannot come until we are sealed in our minds, in our heads, in our, in, on our foreheads. And we know the seal of God. We've explained it and we know the seal of Satan. And, and, and that is why God cannot come. Hi, Pa. Can I ask you something? Okay. Um, the way that I understand this, in the Old Testament, they have the sanctuary, right? right. And the cleansing of the sanctuary was happening on the day of atonement they had yes. a set of rituals that were performed by the levitical high priest to yes. cleanse the sanctuary of their accumulated sins because what happens previously is that when people repented and they brought an animal to be sacrificed they sacrificed the animal and the blood of the animal was then sprinkled into the veil in the sanctuary so eventually you know, throughout the years, the sanctuary became unclean, right, with all these sins and, and, and the blood. So they had to cleanse the sanctuary. Yeah. Now, but what before that, sorry, can I just say that before that happens, for a whole week, there needed to be a cleansing, uh, a forsaking of sins. So the, the, the festival, the festival of, um, what's it called? Um, they needed to forsake sin before this day. Forsake? Yeah. What, what does it mean, forsake? To give up. To give up sin. Give right. up the sinful ways. Yes, yes. But go on. Sorry. Yes, I'm listening. Yep. For a week before the, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Sanctuary, yes. Right. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> in, in the sanctuary, I understand the cleansing. And then 
you know, when they cleanse the sanctuary, then they transfer all the sins to the scapegoat and they send the scapegoat into the desert, right? Yeah. So exactly what happened in 1844? I know what happened in the Old Testament with the cleansing of the sanctuary. The pre-advent judgment is out. The pre-advent judgment. Yes. yes. Okay, so what does it mean? Uh, so, uh, you, you talk, you talk. Uh, so, uh, so, so when you, yeah, so, so when, you, when you look at history, that's why you need to go back in history, right? From that date, um, 1798, you will see there were Bibles being written you will see Martin Luther, you'll see all those stories that were sprinkled right through there that brought this message to, to be seen as what they believe, before, what, what, they, what people were believing is not right. This is right. But it's, it's not pure yet. The gospel has not been preached purely that God is love. There are so many people that is still not. So over this time, from 1844, this message has slowly been growing and growing that God is love. And, and I've seen it change many people's lives. I've seen it work. I've seen <laughs> my life too. I've seen, I've seen what it will do to this world to trust God the way he wanted to be. Not by force, not by fear, but by love. And not by love as well, just by knowing what is right and doing the right thing. Um, so so in, 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 in 1844, there was this swell of this truth being revealed. And, 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 and God is working in our hearts through the Holy Spirit to get back to the message that he gave to his disciples. Okay. Anybody else wants to say anything? Uh, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ipe, for your message. And um, you have so many questions, and um, but now we have <laughs> our chance to answer <laughs> some of your questions, not all of them, because time is limited. Yeah, and um, the reason you said why Jesus Christ did not come in yet, because uh, uh, according to what you just mentioned, Yes, there is, there is a lot of reason for Jesus Christ not coming. As you just mentioned yourself, uh, that it must be the same like Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 7. Uh, the the 144,000 have to be sealed and the four angels uh, in the corner, uh, for, in the four corner, like north, south, south east. You know, the, the, the world is round anyway. But uh, when we're talking about the corner, you know what, what, we, what the Bible means. Yeah, and um, but to understand the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, we have to understand the earthly sanctuary. What did happen in, uh, as Rod mentioned, every year in a day of atonement, right? But I, I, I will read a very short uh, message come from a book called The Great Controversy, page 421, paragraph and also he going to uh, 422. Now, listen to this one. He, he, he puts these two, these two cleansing together, the earthly one and the heavenly one. We'll yes, make it yes. very simple yes. to know what the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary means. Yes. It's very plain and clear. He said, as, as unsciously, the sins of the people were by faith, place upon the sins offering and through its blood transfer in figure of the earthly sanctuary. You know, we're talking about faith here. If you not have faith, it's not working. Everything is about faith. Faith on someone. What this word faith means or belief is to depend totally on someone. And that someone is God himself or Jesus Christ. Mm. Now, he said, so in the new covenant, because that is an old covenant back then in the heaven, in the earthly sanctuary. But after Jesus Christ, we have a new covenant. So in the new covenant, the sins of repentant are by, are by faith placed upon Christ and transfer in fact 
to the heavenly sanctuary. Yes, yes. Now, yes. and as a typical cleansing of the earthly was accomplished by the removal of the sins by which it had been polluted. So the actual cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, of the heavenly, is to be accomplished by the removal, by the removal or blotting out, or blotting out the sins which are there recorded. That point is very important to understand. That what he's talking about, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, to blot it out, the sin which have been uh, recorded in the book. God is speaking a language. If God was here today, he will not talking about the book. He will talking about the computer for us to understand. But at that time they use a the book, God talking about the book. You know, but you know, God not need all of that, you know, but uh, it's good. God is speaking a language men can understand. Now, mm -hmm. but before <laughs> this, before this can be accomplished, there must be an examination of the book of record to determine who through repentance of sin and faith in Christ are entitled to the benefit of his atonement. Mm -hmm. Now, he said, the cleansing of the sanctuary therefore involves a work of, I put it pre-advent judgment, but he said investigative judgment, right? Pre-advent judgment because God does not need to investigate anything. He know everything. But pre-advent judgment that is a judgment before the last judgment to happen. That is make everybody understand a work of judgment, right? This work must be performed prior to the coming of Christ to redeem his people. For when he comes, for when he comes, his reward is with him to give to every man according to his work. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Everybody will receive a reward, good or bad. Mm. That is your decision. Whatever you choose, if you choose to be with God, that is your reward, eternal life. If you choose to be uh, outside of God, you don't have nothing to do with God. That means, as I just said last week, if you, um, if you hate God, you love death. Mm. You, you imagine 1,000 years in heaven and the sun will not give his light for 1,000 years. What will happen to this world? First of all, there is no food at all. No tree will grow and all the water will be ice. And after 1,000 years, when God, when God let the light, let the sun come back again, the sun will not come back like it is. It will come back the same like in the times of, of Adam and Eve, seven times brighter. And those people who have been resurrected, the, the wicked who have been resurrected, I don't know how much food there is in their tummy. And if they was blind, they will still blind. If they miss one arm or miss one leg, they will still be the same, not, not change, like the one who accept God. Now, you imagine how long they will be survived. There is no food out there. That's the reason the Bible said the, 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 the Satan's, said to them, let's go to get, to get to go into the city to get the tree of life to eat. You know, and when and, and that the reason because there's no food out there. That's the problem. That's the thing we we have to make our mind clear. God will not kill anyone, but they will die by themselves because mm -hmm. God cannot do nothing uh, about that. God have to allow them to, to receive the reward they choose to receive. It's, that's the only thing I can sh share with you today. James, what, um, what um, was that quote again? What page was that from Great Controversy? Uh, Great Controversy 421 paragraph three, and then you can go to uh, 422. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yes, very simple so one and explain to you what did happen. 
in the cleansing of the earthly heavenly sanctuary. Very clear. But both of them work similarly. Both yes. with them but, work with faith, not yes. work, not one by work and the other one by faith. Both work by faith. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with you, James. There's, there, there is an <laughs> Not with me, yeah. with the great controversy. Yeah, yeah. I'm like you, yeah. my brother. Yeah. But <laughs> your yeah. point that you're bringing out, and, and, mm. I, and I truly think that, um, remember God said he took the first fruits to heaven, right? Mm. Um, there needed to be, uh, 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 there was no judgment for them. There were people that were risen there. There was no time for them. But when I, when I look at the investigative judgment, it's more for people to understand, like you said, we know, we, we know the consequences of climbing a 10 story building, what will happen to you, right? Mm. But, but with sin, it's so much harder. So, so with sin, the angels, the angels are looking, and I'm not saying I'm right, but this is what I believe, are going through the Old Testament and opening the books and really understanding why why those people are saved through faith and and they could only understand it by the blood of jesus what jesus has done so when these books are open and when when they read it like we are going to read the stories of our families but the only way that we can understand why they are there why they're not there is looking at jesus and, and when we investigate when god lays these books open it's not like he needs our agreement. We will understand why they are lost. Like I understand if I jump 10 stories, I design law, this is what will happen. But you needed to see that for yourself and be convincing yourself. Mm. And like what's happening in heaven, angels are also at work in our hearts and minds. That is why I just wanted, there's just so much to the sanctuary, cleansing of the sanctuary. There's just so much. But why I think it's important, because we don't know. We aren't seeing the books. We aren't reading. That's not important for us. I think what is important for us now to prepare ourselves as brides for the coming uh, groom. Because if we don't do that, we will always say, oh, yeah, I think Jesus will come. It will pass us by. Other people will come into the work to do the work. And we will be lost. Because we are looking at the, the, the signs but we aren't looking at the sign that God gave us, which is our hearts and our minds being cleansed. Thank and you very much. And also, and sorry, and also the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is not only for us, it's also for the angel, because the angel watched too. You know That's what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, I was going to say that. I was just going to say the cross, we talk about the cross, the atoning sacrifice on the cross was not just for us. Exactly. It was, it was for the rest of the universe. But mm. before I add maybe my two cents or something, I think Anthony was actually going to say something and then, but James was just a little bit ahead of him. So I may open up the, the mic for, for Anthony because I think he wanted to say something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, guys. Even though I'm a little bit unwell. Mm. Um, um, just a quick question, Hyper. Did you read Revelation 11, 19? No. You read it for us. Okay, so this for me, this is the um, the best uh, explanation of uh, the fact that there is, a, there is a sanctuary in heaven. I, I could be wrong, but uh, you guys tell me what you think. So the first thing we have to understand is that the book of Revelation is written according to the sanctuary. So it starts uh, with Jesus standing among the seven candlesticks. Yeah. which is the holy of holies so which is the holy place and then at the end when it gets to the middle it then switches to the most holy place two things that have to do with the day of atonement right so to show this um in revelation 11 verse 19 um then god's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was seen the ark of the covenant and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. And then from this time onwards, you go to chapter 12, and then it dis discusses the 1,260 days, but it's only doing that so that it can tell you about the mark of the beast. And then um, everything that's happening afterwards, 
is things that are related to the day of atonement. That's why at the end you've got the final plagues and there's no more mess because so, at the end. So, so what you're trying to say, Anthony, is that I just want to understand it. So the sanctuary in heaven looks like the sanctuary on earth. No, um, what I'm saying is, oh, okay. it's it's showing us that there was a transition in what was being done in heaven. Oh yes, that that things moved on to the ark of the covenant, which is the most uh, the most holy place, the holy of holies, which is the day of atonement. So it the book literally tells you itself that there's things that happen before the day of atonement, and there's things that happen after the day of atonement. And that's why you've got that passage there because it's showing you that things have transitioned, have transitioned, sorry, from one section to the other. So these are the things that have to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so then that's why uh, it then um, at the top, it discusses how the temple was uh, trodden underfoot for 1,260 days in chapter 11. And then it goes into the most holy place and then it goes back to describing everything properly. So to me, that just it's. Uh, I think that's the best um, thing that I think shows that there is a change in the in the sanctuary service in heaven. Because right? if you go back, you can see that the, all the things that are being done are in the holy place. Now, the the big difference is from there on, you have talk of the of the devil, direct talk of the devil. Uh, in the book of Revelation, you now have direct talk about the devil and talk about the Ten Commandments, or sorry, or the commandments of God and the Ark of the Covenant, which is a, a sign of the restoration of and the knowledge of God's law. That's why it, it's linked with the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments represent uh, God's eternal law. So it's saying from 1844, a message would come that's related to the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Ten Commandments, which is, uh, which is a sign of the eternal design. So that message is what causes the cleansing of the sanctuary, because then the church can be cleansed of all the sins that it has been committing, because it doesn't understand the way God runs the world. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my story. Uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. Mm. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I know you, a little bit under the weather, but may, uh, by God's grace, may you be well soon. Um, yeah, just, I guess my comment is just simple. It's just a re, regurgitation or a re, <clears throat> a re, um, restating some of the things that you guys have already said, though, about the, the, the sanctuary, the, the, the sanctuary on, uh, on earth, as we know, was the example or the model of the one in heaven. And um, I think that we know that from, it's in Hebrews, I think it's in 13, where it says that the, the sacrificing of goats and sheep and stuff is not the things that would take away, pardon me, take away our sins. Um, and I'm just trying to make it really simple. And then we, we hear, uh, especially from James's great controversy quote about what happened in heaven and uh, how we were <clears throat> forgiven for our sins. And I think that we need to understand that, and I think Hyper, you were saying it was that before there was not this message about, about uh, God's, uh, it, there was the message, but it wasn't as clear as it was as when Christ came to give the message about God's character and God's government. And um, from that time on, um, we were able to then know um, know the uh, who God is, and we can, as James has said several times, and I really like the definition he gives, so we could depend on God, and we can rely on God, and as we use, we can have trust and confidence in believing God, and some of us use the word faith uh, to heal us, um, to 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 heal us from are as hyper you mentioned earlier about the mind and the heart and things like that. So it can heal our mind and our heart and our view that we have of him and that we will no longer walk in sin or want to continue committing sins. 
and things like that. So I think the sanctuary message is, is important, but it, it's only important as it points out that we can depend on Christ and we can trust Christ and that um, the sacrificial system on the earth was just an example. We know the blood of bulls and, goats and stuff do not take away our sins. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. God himself came, Emmanuel, to be with us and, and garbed himself in humanity and died that we may have the choice, the freedom of choice to choose. As James said, the choice is yours. So if you choose, if, if, you, if you hate God, you love death. But if you choose God, you will have eternal life. Hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a same, it's the same like um, in the times of Moses in the wilderness, when the serpent and the scorpion, all the deadly animals, yeah, yeah just uh, bite those uh, Israel people. And, um, and then later on, they beg Moses to talk to God. And when God talk, go, Moses talked to God, and then he said, take this bronze and serpent, make a bronze and serpent on a pole. And each one who look at, the, who, who, who receive a bite, each one who look at this serpent with face will be saved. Mm. That's give us an example. The same like Jesus Christ as well. If we look at on Jesus Christ on the cross or wherever you look at it, without face, nothing will happen. All must all going with faith, all work with faith, yeah. according to the Bible and Paul. Yes. And, and and if you look at the stories in history, right? Satan saw he was losing the fight against Christians. He already lose it. <laughs> yeah, you know, but 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 what, what I'm trying to say after after Jesus was taken up and and his people was on the earth, the gospel kept on growing Amen. and growing. And growing. And, 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 and I think he realized I could not stop these people. So he infiltrated the, the, the Christian church. And he gave them a new gospel. Mm. It almost happened. The end would have come. But he knew because the world would have been taken away from him. And the people will be sealed in two groups. Those that decide for God. Those that trust for God. And there will be two groups at the end of time. And before the time of trouble comes, because when this time of trouble comes, will there be people that have faith in God? That's what Christ said. Well, shall I find faith? Yeah, it, and it won't be long. When Jesus comes after the real tribulation, it won't be long. So there is an, very much an importance, and we can see it in our churches, for them to understand Jesus will not come until the message of it, the good news is preached. And until people understand what is righteousness, you were speaking about it, Sean and James, but through faith. What is righteousness through faith? The 1880, the 1888 message that was given to our church, that Ellen G. White says the coming of the Lord would have been around the corner, and they never accepted that message. And that but is also we are wandering in the wilderness. We are still wandering another hundred years in the wilderness. Yeah, they only wandered 40. We still in there. Yeah. Um, but but one of the things that we do have to remember when we're talking about the ceiling and Christ can't come until the ceiling, there's one thing that we must understand. If you make a decision or you don't make a decision, <laughs> you make a you've decision. made a decision. <laughs> yes. So God will come. Yes, God will God come. come. And there was a ceiling, but, but uh, at that time, nobody need to worry. If you already seal, that means you protect by God. No one can touch you. Amen. They will be dead. They will kill the, each other by themselves. They will be dead. But if you've been in the part, if you're still alive, I'm still alive, we've been a part of 144,000, have nothing to worry about because you already seal and no one will touch you. You will be alive according to Second Second or First Thessalonians, Paul said. Uh, we will, we we will, we will, we which we is still alive will remain. And and also the the first resurrection, those people who have died in Christ will resurrect it. Both group will become one group and met Jesus Christ in the air. But you see, there, there's no worry to be too afraid to be scared about it. We have to stay firm. The same like injection. When the injection coming, 
there's nothing to be worried about. You know, praise the Lord anyway. Because yeah. there's an importance to these prophecies that were given. There's an importance to it, especially Amen. those dates weren't just given for us to look by. Those dates are given to us as way marks of importance. Hmm. And, and we need to understand these prophecies, not for, for, for our knowledge or understanding, but to know that God is working within us, that God is always at work. And Satan may do his things, but God is at work in our hearts and our minds. Amen. He's working. Mm. Yeah. One thing that I like to say is that in the sanctuary, <clears throat> that was like a theater to understand the problem of sin and the plan of salvation, right? Mm. Amen. And we all know that no one has ever lived or died without sin, except Christ, who was sinless. So all the people that have died, even though they have died being a Christian and converted and all that, they all have sins in them. And I think the cleansing of the sanctuary, as well as it started in 1844, uh, is that the Bible tells us, and it's in 1 Corinthians 15, verse around 52, 53, says that the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put, must be put on incorruption mm -hmm. and this mortal must put on immortality. So there will be a change that will happen to all those people that are dead and alive. And we're talking about the first resurrection, right? Mm. So something will change because now everyone who is born is born with an infection. We're sinful. infected by this virus called sin. It's a sinful nature. We mm. just can't help it. No. We are born selfish and we are born with an inclination for selfishness and to sin. So it is like almost there's no escape. And we have to almost fight in order to get rid of it. But we can't fully get rid of it, right? So something will happen. God will make something happen. So when people on the first resurrection and those who are alive that they will be lucky uh, to be on the 144,000 mm. will change into incorruption. Correct? Yeah, I mean. So <clears throat> I think the cleansing of the sanctuary as well has to do with that mm. is to apply the character of Christ into the 144,000, and also the people who are resurrected first. So I think that will the not... healing and the trusting. The more so, we trust the yeah. healing, you know, from sin, and the more we trust is the more we will receive the character and, and uh, of God. Yes. I, I, wish, I wish I can change myself. I will do it right now. <laughs> but I can't. You know, and that that what made me happy. You know, otherwise I will I will what how Paul pulls that. Paul said uh, the things you know, I want to do. No, you know, Paul said you will be boast boasted like uh, like so I'm proud of him, of myself. I can do this, you know. But yeah. uh, no, you can't do nothing. Jesus Christ said, just trust me. Everything will be fine, you know. He said, but I'm sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinful sinner, you know. And he said, don't worry about it. Trust me. I, I will be able to change everything for you as long as you trust me. That is very simple and clear. Sometimes we want to fight, try to fight order, but we can't do it. We have to let Jesus Christ do it for us. And he already done it. 2000 years ago <laughs> you know we yeah. just we just vote we just vote on his side that's what we have to do and trust him like uh, I, uh, sean said and yourself and Ipa and anthony also mentioned trust as well yeah and that's our, the only thing we can and our do. minds are deceitful above everything we exactly my brother yeah you, 
it, it, sometimes you think the, when, when it says the mind are deceitful, it doesn't say the person is deceitful, which means he is deceitful to others. It means that mind of mine, my mind, is lying to myself so that I can do the wrong thing. That is how deceitful we are. Maybe. I forget how many sections we have in our brain. If two or three, you know, any, anything you do, any times, any thinking or anything you watch will go to one part, one place. Any spiritual thing will go to direct where God, uh, thinking about God, thing like that. Now you're thinking to yourself, uh, which one you have to watch more and read more? <laughs> you know, uh, is that where you feed yourself? on whatever you want to feed yourself. Amen. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the one thing that struck me as, as very important is, you know, when Paul says that the things I don't want to do, I do. Yes. And I think there are people, you know, that they do things wanting to do those things. <laughs> yes, yes. And for us, the struggle is that sometimes we may, do things that we don't want to do. Yes. I think it's a huge difference. It's a huge difference yeah. in terms that we agree with the way that God commands his universe, the way that his laws are done and everything. We have the sinful nature. It's not excuse for sinning. But um, like Paul said, sometimes we do stuff that we don't want to do, but we don't want to do it. And this is the thing, we don't want to do it, you know? So God understands that. And I think that's the thing that will change into an incorruptible, incorruptible being. I think it's, 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 it's important also to know, I think that God's people at the end of time, before his second coming, it's almost the final conclusion of the whole matter, that God's people will be a special kind of people like none before. I do believe, mm. um, yeah. and I truly believe it, it, it will be huge. Um, I'm not saying, I don't know if the sinners will be more, I don't make judgments like that, but um, I would think the sinners would be more, but <laughs> I don't want to think about it. But what, what I wanted to just say is that, that we don't know when we are perfect. When we try to look at ourselves and say, oh, am I good enough now? Or am I good enough then? No, no. But you must give to God what belongs to God, you know. Like God said about the text by here too. Uh, he says, give the text to, to, the, to the Caesar. The Caesar, that belongs. But there's one thing that belongs to God, and it's his soul. And it's our soul. And God wants to restore that soul. And that's why I want to just close in this, which we spoke about, about this, this perfection that we speak about. We don't know where God leads us and where God wants us to be. Um, and to show the universe that he can fully heal us. I truly believe God can fully heal us. Revelation chapter, sorry, no, not Revelation. This comes out of Ellen G. White. We use the few topics. Um, and um, she says this, your faculties are separate and distinct, yet each is dependent of its own success upon the other. So each day God works with his building stroke upon stroke to perfect the structure which does grow into a holy temple for the Lord. One stone mislaid affects the whole building. Mm. This figure represents human character which is to be brought upon point by point. There is not to be a flaw in it for it is the Lord's building. Every stone must be perfectly laid that it may endure the pressure placed upon it. So it speaks about very difficult times that the pressure that the soul will withstand. God warns you every God warns you and every worker to take heed how you build, so that your building may bear the test of storm and tempest, because it is riveted to the eternal rock. Take heed how you build. Every hour may be spent in placing the stone on a sure foundation, ready for the day of test and revelation. When we shall be seen just as we are, 
this warning God presents to me as an essential in your case. He loves you with a love that is immeasurable. He loves you. He loves your brethren in, in the faith and he works with them to the same end that he works with you. His church upon the earth is to assume a divine proportions before the world as a temple composed of living stones, every stone emitting light. The building is to be the light of the world, a city set on a hill which cannot be hid. It is composed of stones laid close together, stone fitting, stone making a solid building. All the stones are not of the same form or shape. Some are large, some are small, but each has its own crevice to fill. And the value of each stone is determined by the light it reflects to the world. This is God's plan. And he would have all who profess to believe his work fill their respective places in the great grand work for this time. The Lord's church is composed of a living, working agency who derive their power to act from the author and finisher of, our, of their faith. The great work resting upon God's individual is to be carried forward in symmetrical harmony. Manuscript Release, Volume 2. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for being in this wonderful opportunity to live the life you would like us to live. Father, like we have said, we have no power to bring us to a point that can heal us completely, dear Lord. But you have promised us, I will heal you completely. And Father, if we don't believe that, if we don't believe that, then we don't trust you to do the work. Lord, we saw Moses not trusting you when he hit the rock in frustration, not realizing that when he only was supposed to speak at that time, that you were busy working with these people and trying to restore them. Father, forgive us if we don't do the work like you would like us to do the work, um, where we lose faith in you to do that work in us. Forgive us, Lord. But let us know there's, there will come a time that we will be fully restored, fully brought into this temple of yours that will shine like the brightest light to this world. And not one or two, but many will be drawn to that love. And Father, you desire for us to have it. We are speaking about these things because we desire you to fill our lives with your Holy Spirit and to guide our thoughts in our minds so that we can go back to our blessed home, in the wonderful name of, this, of our Savior and our God, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.